Well, amen. Welcome to Two Cities Church. My name's Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here, whether you're watching online or in the lobby or in here. Uh, if this is your first Sunday, we have a surprise and a special treat for you, okay? <laughs> we are in a series called Song of Solomon, and we're gonna be, we've are gonna we been in this series, and we've been talking about a lot of different topics, okay? Uh, sex, marriage, manhood, womanhood, singleness. Uh, we're going to get into a bunch of different things. Here's what I want you to know. If you're new, or maybe you've been around for a while and you don't know this, the Bible is not a safe book. It was not edited by some committee on some college campus, okay, to make sure that it doesn't offend any of us. Um, no, it is a, not a safe book. A good way to think about the Bible is it's a sacred book, and so therefore it touches on the significant and sensitive things in our lives. Sex is one of those, okay? Now, here's what I want you to understand about the series. So this is an eight-week-long series. Now, I always tell you, I think not in terms of um, sermons, um, but I think in terms of entire series. And so in this series, we knew, hey, for eight weeks, we're going to be in the Song of Solomon. But I want to just tell you this. We knew this from the very beginning, that this was not going to be a series on sex. Now, there's some people who preach Song of Solomon that way. But we knew, okay, there's eight sermons, there's eight chapters. Uh, Kyle's not getting up here and preaching eight weeks on sex, okay? Uh, well, because that's not what the book's about. The book's about sensual love within marriage. And so uh, we're taught, we talked about manhood, womanhood. Okay. Now today we're talking about sex. Now, how did we get here? Uh, first, we talked to the men. We said, listen, uh, men are lonely and are lost and men need to grow up and men need to wake up and men need to reject passivity and embrace responsibility. That was week one. Uh, then we talked to the women and we said, listen, don't try to be a bro or a babe. Those are often the two options, especially on the college campus. Be just like one of the dudes, but in a dress or treat yourself like a commodity and, and just focus on your external uh, appearance. Okay, those aren't good. Instead, embrace being a sister, being a daughter, uh, be, being a wife, being a mother, being the, the, all the roles that women play. Okay, then we talked about dating and, and how do you go from single to spouse. And then last week, okay, here's where we're kind of catching ourselves up. We talked about marriage. Now, here's what marriage is. One man, one woman, one lifetime. What is marriage? It's a covenant of companionship that's made before God and others. So we talked all about that. And we said, hey, marriage is about moving from me to we. Okay, hopefully you guys remember all that. And then we said last week, uh, you do that on the wedding ceremony, you do that positionally and covenantally before God. And then we said the wedding night, you do that physically, and then the rest of your life, you do that practically and progressively. And that's, that's all of marriage, and that's where we'll be for the next couple of weeks. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, like, why are we talking about sex? Like, why? Are, now, there's a couple answers to that. Like, I, I'm not nervous at all. I mean, I told you before, like, some of you are going to be uncomfortable with how comfortable I am up here. I'm talking about all these kind of things, okay? Uh, and, and the reason why that is is, well, I've been preaching for about 15 years, but I've been preaching, you know, through books of the Bible for the last five and a half years. And it's like, well, we're in Pauline's epistles, so a Pauline epistle, so we'll talk about sex. We're in a gospel, and Jesus talks about sex, so we'll talk about sex. We're in Old Testament narrative, and there's a story about sex, so we'll talk about sex. So it's not new to me. We're in the Proverbs, and the Father's giving advice to the Son about sex, so we'll talk about sex. So why are we talking about this? One, it comes up in the Bible, and we're trying to, like the Bible, we're, not, we're trying not to be crude, because that's not helpful and appropriate, and we're trying not to be clinical and medical, because that's not helpful, okay? Like, that's not the questions we're asking. We're asking deeper questions about all of these things. And so why do we talk about this? Well, well think about for yourself for a second. Like, wh when did you have the birds and bees talk? Wh when did your parents talk to you? For me, headed to a fifth grade basketball game for five minutes. <laughs> and I love my dad, and he loves me, and I learned a few things, but that was it. Where are most people going to learn? Now, maybe a lot of you, are, you're, you've got great homes and you've got great plans for how to talk to your kids about it, or maybe you grew up in that type of home. Just so you know, most people didn't. Most people, it's like they learned about it on the back of the bus. Or nowadays, they're Googling it. Who knows what will come up? Or they're looking on YouTube, or, or they're, they're watching pornography, and they're thinking that's what it is. It's like, okay, we have to have this conversation. And, and, and here's why. Because let, let me give you kind of the big idea for the whole sermon. Um, we're going to talk about sex today. And the big idea is this, that sex is the thermometer in your marriage, not the thermostat. What does that mean? That means that it tells you. Here's what your sex life in marriage does, if you didn't know this. It tells you how your overall marriage is going. Sex is the sign and symbol of the marriage. It's the baptism. That's what it is. It's the fruit of the marriage, not the root of the marriage. I remember when Margie and I were in premarital counseling, we were about to get married. I told you about my big, scary pastor that I had. He was a great guy, but he scared us. Okay, and so he, uh, but he said, he said, hey, listen, you're going to go through many ups and downs of marriage. There'll be, you know, you'll struggle with bitterness and resentfulness and lack of communication, and you'll get busy, and you'll have lots of trouble in your marriage. Everybody will. He said, but you'll know your marriage is restored when the sexual relationship is restored. Like, what is he teaching us? Oh, it's the thermometer. It's not the thermostat. So we have to understand today, what is sex? Sex is that which expresses and enhances the oneness in a marriage. That's what it is. 
Sex is the most powerful and comprehensive God word and God centered way to say, I give all of me to all of you. And you give all of you to all of me. That's the, that's the way that you say with your body what you said at the altar with your words. But we live in a, in a society that's confused. Now, here's my concern, okay? And I don't know your sex lives. I don't want to know your sex lives. Um, but, but, um, but here's my concern. My concern is that many people in this church and in our city uh, who've been married for many years are sexless roommates raising kids. And that's not a long-term strategy. Okay, a sexless marriage is a marriage where the couple has sex less than once a month. Why once a month? Well, they, at, when, it, when, it drops below, when it drops below less than once a month, it's so insignificant in the marriage, it's almost as if it didn't exist. See, here's the thing. All of us, this is, what, this is I'm going to kind of speak because a lot of us aren't married. So here's what, here's what and we're going to get to, there's a lot I have to walk through when we talk about sex. <laughs> Uh, our culture and the church. There's a lot of things I have to swim through, and I'm going to do that. So we're going to get to chapter 4, verse 1 in a little bit. Uh, but I need to say a couple other things. And it's that here, here's what all of us need to hear, no matter if we're married or not. What, what happens is around, whenever you go through puberty, so 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever that is, okay? This is all awkward to talk about out loud, okay? But here's, here's what's going to happen. What happens is that you become awakened and alive sexually. And this is why adolescence to teenage years and middle school and high school are so hard and so confusing. Because it's like every, everybody at around 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 has to go, what do I do with this? And by the way, you have to answer that question the rest of your life. And the biblical answer is you integrate your sexuality into your life within the bounds and borders of Scripture. It's not easy to do. But what you want to do is you want to take your sexuality, all of us, and you want to say, what does God say about this? And you want to integrate it into your, so for, I'm talking to the married couples, you want to figure out what sex and romance looks like in your marriage. Here's what happens. The two hardest areas of your life to integrate are your anger and your sexuality. How do we know this? They show up in your fantasy life. How many of you have, right, you fantasize about telling your boss off or your neighbor off? Like, or we have sexual fantasies. Here's what happens. If you don't integrate, and you know this. Some of you experience this, right? Your, your sexuality is like a sub-personality. And when she's not home or he's not home or the kids are away or you travel or you drink too much, it, it gets a life of its own. It's not integrated rightly. Leads to chronic masturbation, leads to pornography, leads to fantasies, leads to emotional affairs. So we have to take our sexuality, submit it before the Lord and integrate it biblically into our lives. And it's very difficult to do, okay? Now here's what we need to tell young people. Sex only makes marriage better Sex makes every relationship other than marriage worse. If you bring sex into any other relationship, it makes that relationship worse. How many of us know some couple that's dating and they've introduced sex into the relationship? It's like, oh, can't talk to them about it anymore. They can't even see how dysfunctional this, this marriage is. Or sorry, not this marriage, this dating relationship is. They don't even know how incompatible they are because they don't talk. They've invited the sexual element way too early into the relationship and it's added a dysfunction to the entire relationship. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about the ways, we're going to look at the scriptures in a few minutes, I want to talk about the different ways people view sex in the same way I talked about the different ways people view marriage. Some people idolize sex, okay? How do we know that people idolize sex? Well, you can always tell what somebody worships by what they're willing to sacrifice. That's a good way. They're the same word, basically. Worship and sacrifice, it's like the same word. So, okay, what are people willing to worship? People idolize sex so much, what are they willing to sacrifice? Their personal integrity. Right? What's the big problem with porn addiction? Deceit. That's the bigger problem. I'm willing to become the kind of person who has things that I hide. Why? Because I like it too much. I don't know how to integrate it, and it's an idol in my life. Well, pe people are willing to sacrifice their health. What is, what is abortion? We will sacrifice unborn children so that we can have as much sex as we'd like. It's all sacrifice. Others demonize it, okay? Now, you have to know the church has had a history, unfortunately, especially the Catholic Church, of demonizing sex. They don't realize that sex has two purposes, pleasure and procreation. They, they've overemphasized procreation. So there was a season where the Catholic Church told the, their church members, you can only have sex 44 days a year. Some of you have sex demonized because of something that happened to you, and we're sorry. 
right? This is a really sad part of certain people's stories. They've had sexual abuse. They've been sexually assaulted. They've had sexual trauma. Sometimes this happened when they were very, very young. And so for them, they associate sexual activity with evil. And it becomes something that they demonize in their life. Other people trivialize it. This is, can happen in the church a lot. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. Yes, it's only one element and dimension of your life. That's for sure. But are you, I mean, I'm going to ask the married couples. I mean, do you want to give up in sex and romance in your marriage for the next couple decades? I would not recommend that. That's not a long-term strategy, and it's going to show up in all the worst and weirdest ways in your life if you don't figure out sex and romance and how to integrate it into your marriage. So what do we need to do? We need to realize it's a gift from God. That's what, sex is a gift from God. For God, I mean, look, God invented sex. It's, it's worth thinking about just for like, who is this God? I mean, he invented something as good and pleasurable as sex itself. Now, there are lies that people believe about sex. Let me tell you the lies people believe, that it's only physical, right? If you believe in Darwinian evolution, it's like, well, I mean, if you're hungry, eat. I mean, if you're thirsty, drink. And if you're tired, sleep. And if you've got some sexual whatever, I mean, go do it. That's kind of, it's only physical. Here's another lie. So that's a lie. We all know that. Um, it's only, it, it's a casual and transactional. So this is, we've been in a mo massive social sexual experiment since the 1960s, trying to help us understand what's going on here. So basically what happens when birth control, and this isn't a sermon on birth control, but when birth control ca came in, what happened is women for the first time in human history had voluntary control over the reproductive system. Never happened in all of human history. And so everybody thought in the 60s, maybe sex is free. I mean, if you're not a Christian, there might be a certain law. Maybe the price of sex is zero. Because if we don't have to worry about pregnancy, maybe everything's okay. And so then there was this kind of free love movement. How's that working for everybody? Well, not very good. It's like, well, maybe we can't divorce sex from responsibility. Maybe we can't divorce sex from, you know, <laughs> family. Maybe we can't divorce sex from emotional behavior. In fact, there was, a, there was a famous poster that went around Campus Crusade for Christ. It was a poster that got on these college campuses, and it had um, four different condoms on it. And then under the condoms, it said, too bad, there's not one for your heart. Well, why? Because I think everybody knows that that's the truth. So there's the lie it's only physical. There's the lie that it's casual. And then there's the lie that it's safe. Safe sex. It's like, man, only modern people think sex is safe. I mean, sex isn't safe at any level of analysis ever. It, sex isn't safe because of chance of pregnancy, obviously. In fact, what, what happened with AIDS? AIDS in, in the 1980s, early 1990s, AIDS was the way to go, whoo, guess sex isn't safe. Thought, thought if we had a birth control pill, sex was safe. Nope, looks like sex isn't safe. So we're in this massive social experiment to go, what should we do? Now, what I want us to do with the time left is we're going to look at this beautiful picture of Solomon and the Shulamite uh, lady and them coming together on their wedding night. Look at me at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Here, 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 by the way, interesting, during the wedding day, who speaks the whole time? The woman. During the wedding night, who speaks the whole time? The guy, okay? There's only one thing the woman says the whole night. You'll see this in a little bit, okay? Here's what he says. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. And then he speaks of, he's gonna go, by the way, in chapter four here, he starts at the top and goes all the way down. And uh, top of her head and goes down. Uh, in chapter seven, he starts at her feet and go all the way up. Okay, but this, this, this is where he starts. He says, your eyes are doves behind your veil. So there's an intimacy. He's looking her in the face. By the way, humans are the only creatures who have sex face to face with their entire bodies touching. Why? Because God designed it. And it's not just physical pleasure, it's relational intimacy, and we know it. So he says this. He says, okay, he's not the best at compliments. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead, okay? That, that was his way to go, hey, look, you've got this beautiful black hair that, that's flowing. That's what he's saying. Um, I'm gonna try to help us together uh, from scripture to, to kind of pull out some principles and practices that we're learning here. Here's the first principle and practice, that he t before he touches her body, he touches her heart. All the guys are like, thank you, I needed help. <laughs> you know, by the way, guys, we don't know what we're doing, ladies, just so you know, for sure, okay? Uh, absolutely, we don't know what we're doing. And so part, part of it, well, here's the problem with guys. So what he, what he does here, and we'll see this, is he's going to create, and you can't just do this in the bedroom. 
But he's going to create with his words, and more than just his words, his words are what we see here. He's going to create an environment, this is so important, where the woman is flourishing, where she feels safe, where she feels protected, where she feels beautiful, and where she feels confident. He's going to create, we're seeing it in the bedroom, but this is, this is an environment that he creates over all. And he's going to do it, in this case, he's going to do it with his words. Okay, now for most men, sex is like, so women, you've heard this before, women are crock pots, right? Men are microwaves. Most men, they come to sex with like a formula and a math mentality. Like, okay, we watched a, a Netflix show. I put my arm around her. It, it ended up happening. We had sex. That was great. You would try to watch a Netflix show and put your arm around the next night. Like, she's like, no way. Like, what? This worked last night. <laughs> it's like men, men have like a math mindset. I took her on a date night. I said some nice things and it worked. Then you do it again. You're like, it didn't work. It's because it, it's a large, this is all in the context of relationship. This is all way more organic than we, than we probably want it to be. And this takes a lot more time than we want it to take. Um, look, look, look what he says next. I want you to see this. Uh, look at verse two. Your teeth are like the flock of shorn ewes. All right, here he goes. That, that have come up from the washing. They have to understand this is before modern dentistry, okay? Uh, look at this. All of which bear twins and not one among them has lost its young. He's saying, you got all your teeth. And that's what he says. <laughs> or literally in the Hebrew, I can see you're not from West Virginia. Okay, that's what he's saying. <laughs> I love our West Virginia friends, I'm kidding. Um, so here, here's all the, he, here's the principle, guys. He's noticing things about her. This is throughout. He's noticing things about her and he's complimenting her. How many of us guys, I don't know, pick on the guys just for a second, here, but how many of us guys, we just, we don't notice our wives anymore, right? It's like, we don't notice that, she, I mean, we could say something shallow, like we didn't notice she got a haircut or we didn't notice her outfit or something, or we didn't notice that she's upset. We, we, we didn't notice that she was overwhelmed. We didn't notice that that was actually something that she was very excited and passionate about and wanted to talk to us about. Paying attention, the posture of paying attention is the posture of humility. It's the posture of the heart of unselfishness. I am trying to not be all about myself in this moment, and I'm trying to watch, and I'm trying to see what's happening. That's what he's doing here. Look what he does next. Verse three, your lips are like scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. So ba basically back then, he's like, your lips are small and thin. And back then, that was considered pretty. It just reminds you how things change. Today, having full lips, I think, is, is considered pretty, okay? So here's what most people think is beginning to happen in verse three. They're beginning to kiss. We'll see later they start to passionately kiss, but they are beginning to kiss. Is it good for couples to kiss? Married couples to kiss? Yes, okay? Kissing, by the way, is a big sign of the health of a marriage. Should you kiss in front of your kids? Absolutely. Maybe not super passionately, but, but kissing in front of your kids, yes. So if, when I come home a lot of times, if Margie's in the kitchen, I've got a 10-year-old, an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, I'll say to my kids, do you want me to kiss mom or tickle mom? And they'll say both, and I'm like, this is gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> Mostly just for me. No, but they, but they, but they love it. They, they lo it makes kids feel safe when they, when they see that relationship. So they begin to kiss. By the way, you know, kissing is the on-ramp in merging onto the highway of sexual activity. This is why you, know, you gotta be careful when dating, with kissing and all of these different things, with all these boundaries. All right, look, look verse uh, three. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate. She's starting to blush. Behind your veil, he's not, again, he struggles with some of these compliments. Your neck is like the Tower of David. You have a huge neck, basically. <laughs> That's what he's saying. But, but what he's really saying is, so back then, you know, you've heard of like people are stiff-necked. That's like you're rebellious. And slouch-necked, that was like you're not confident. So he's basically actually speaking of her posture and her elegance and her dignity. Uh, they thought, the, the Hebrews thought a lot of the neck and what it communicated. So your neck is like the Tower of David built in rows of stone, and on it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. This is where people begin to get a little uncomfortable. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. So, okay, one of my favorite things to do is to go back and to read how the Puritans and how old religious people interpreted these verses. I, I promise you, they said, it's very clear, the left breast is the old covenant, and the right breast is the new covenant. I promise you. They said, the, the old, the, 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 it's clear the left breast is the law, and the right breast is the gospel. One commentator said, the left, bre the left breast is clearly Moses, and the right breast is clearly Aaron. It's like, only a religious person would ever think that, okay? <laughs> um, what this is, it's very interesting. So, so 
uh, part of what I'm trying to do is, is to get under a little bit of how we think about these things. So when, when we read verses like this, when we read books like this, because part of, by the way, what Song of Solomon does is it gives us an attitude and a worldview toward lovemaking. I mean, we're getting some practicals and all that and principles. Really what the Song of Solomon does is it gives us an attitude and an overall worldview toward lovemaking within marriage, which it talks about it in beautiful but colorful ways. And this makes two different types of people uncomfortable, and we're going to talk about this, okay? It makes people who maybe are used to purity culture, it makes them feel a certain way, and people who are used to porn culture makes them feel a certain way. Let me explain the difference. Purity culture, it's something that really kind of came out in the 90s. I'm going to explain this in just a few minutes here. It came out in the 90s and early 2000s, and purity culture basically said, hey, sex is dirty and gross. Save it for the one you love. <laughs> I mean, some version of that. And really, and I'll talk about this, there were some good things that came out of it, but really it, it made people feel very uncomfortable about, to, you know, about talking about sex. So, like, you know, if you're from purity culture and you're from, like, a very religious background, you might read some of these verses and go, I don't know what to do with this. This makes you feel very uncomfortable. If you're from porn culture, it's like, ooh, how graphic does this get? It's like, well, that's, that's not the right way to think about this either. It doesn't get very graphic. It stays poetic in how it's talking about things, but it talks about different parts of the body and all of these sexual things, okay? But it, it does it in beautiful, romantic, poetic ways. So let me talk just for a few minutes about purity culture because I, I, we, the church, maybe not this church, but the church in America has been influenced by purity culture. Now, purity culture, it happened in the 90s and 2000s. Purity culture, you've heard of like maybe things like Silver Ring thing or True Love Weights or these movements. They, they went to high school youth groups and um, they, 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 would, they were nationwide things, and they were a response to hook up, shack up, break up, feel a bunch of regret and shame, do it again, okay? So my, I came to Christ in 2001, and my experience with uh, purity culture was like two thumbs up. I'm like, so I, I, again, public high school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The world I grew up in was co-ed sleepovers and sexual activity in the middle school bathrooms. So when when... Purity culture came and it was like, hey, virginity is a good thing and let's be modest and let's save sex for marriage and let's be intentional with our dating. It's like, sign me up. That sounds great. But what happened is, now this is, we need to learn this. A lot of things, um, people start with really good motives. Most like all these things, the people start with good motives, but then the religious spirit takes over. Okay, you can see this. Okay, and I told you, winston Salem's a religious city, so you'll be able to relate to this. The religious spirit is controlling and the religious spirit is um, Focus on the external. So what's interesting, when I read a lot about this this week, guess who's so upset about purity culture? Women. They've written almost all the articles against it and their terrible experiences. Why? Because they felt like it got really goofy with modesty. They felt like one lady said it became the sexualization of all touch, that men became afraid of women. It became an emphasis on virginity to the extreme of not talking about repentance and renewal and purity of heart. And it preached a false gospel. It preached the prosperity gospel of sex to the evangelical church, which was this. If you stay pure and get married, you'll have great sex. You know, and all the married people are like, <laughs> not, not necessarily. And, and, and what happened is, is, is a lot of these women, they're still single and they're upset. Or they got married and it didn't work out. And they're very, very upset. And so we, 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 we want to talk about sex in compelling, clear, beautiful ways within the context of covenant, avoiding the extremes of purity culture and avoiding the extremes of the porn culture, okay? So I say all that because it's about to get a little bit more colorful here, okay? Here's what it says. Um, let's look at uh, verse five. Your two breasts are like two fawns. What, what is he saying? Your breasts are cute. I mean, what are fawns? They're cute, Okay. He's saying they're really cute. They're twins of a gazelle that graze among the lily until the day breeze and the shadows flee. And then he says it again. Look at this. I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and I will go away to the hill of frankincense. He is literally giving her breast nicknames. Some of you, this makes you incredibly uncomfortable. Okay, let me explain this. This is helpful to know, okay? And this is actually something I don't think you learned in the first even couple years of marriage. There is an element of play in sex. You have a play circuit in your brain, okay? You can't live without play. By the way, play is, you can only play when everything else is going well. Like, it'll, it'll, okay, now, now I can play. Okay, 
there is a element of warm and winsome play and humor and laughter and enjoyment, often laughing at yourselves in sex. And what he's saying is he's using this warm, winsome, loving language toward his spouse. Look, look what he says in verse seven. He, he sums up again, verse seven. You are all together beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. What, what is he saying? Is he saying, you, is her body perfect? Obviously not. No woman's body is perfect. No man's body is perfect. What he's saying is the way that I want you to see yourself, how I see you, and that's what women will do. They'll see themselves through the eyes of their husband. And he's saying, I want you to see that, I, that there's literally no flaw in you. Here's what he's saying. You are mine. I'm going to unpack this more, in, I think, in weeks to come. You are my standard of beauty, which is a key principle for long-term marriage, that your spouse is your standard of beauty. See, what happens to most people is like their standard of beauty is like some pornographic thing or some romance novel thing or some Instagram person or some celebrity thing or some fantasy life. It's like, really? It's like, no, no, your standard of beauty is your spouse. So when Margie married me, she was into guys with hair, Okay. <laughs> Now she's into bald guys. I mean, she's, you know, it's just like when she married me, she was into 25-year-olds. Now she's into 37-year-olds, right? I mean, and it's funny, but it's like that's actually what keeps the marriage. It's like, you know, did your, did your, was your you know, spouse thin? You were into thin people. Is he overweight? You like overweight guys now, you know? <laughs> but but what, instead of we have this, fic, this unrealistic and fictitious version of beauty that we're constantly comparing our spouse to, and they're failing and falling short of it because that person doesn't really exist in real life, right? Did God give Adam like 25 choices? No, Adam, here's Eve. She's your wife, she's your, now your standard of beauty. So that's an incredibly important principle. In fact, what he's gonna do in verses one through seven is he's going to say seven things about her that he loves. I just already read them. Why is that important? Well, because in Hebrew, seven is a number of completion and perfection. So he's doing something very creatively. He's, he's basically saying, in my eyes, you're perfect, and in my eyes, you're complete. That's what's happening there. Let's go on to verse eight. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. Come with me from Lebanon. Depart from the peak of Amana, from the peak of Sinir and Hermon, from the dens of lions, from the mountains of leopards. And most people think he's saying, it's time for us to come together. They're not really in Lebanon. He's like, it's the language of we have kept ourselves sexually at a great distance in our dating and in our engagement. It's now time for us to fully come together. Okay, verse nine, you've captivated my heart, my sister, my bride, you've captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Look at this, your lips drip nectar, my bride, honey and milk are under your tongue. This is French kissing before France existed. Okay, that's what this is. The fragrance of your garments is the fragrance of Lebanon, okay? So things are really getting heated up here. I want you to see this in verse 12. Um, he begins to talk holistically about her body. Here's what he says. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. Your shoots are an orchard of pomegranates with the choicest fruits, henna and nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinema, cinnamon. Uh, all the trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, and all the choice spices. A garden, second time he calls her garden, a garden fountain, a well of living water and flowing streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, O come, O south wind, blow upon my garden. Third time it's called a garden. She's called a garden. Blow upon my garden, let its spices flow. Now this is really, I think, a beautiful imagery. So what is the imagery of a woman's body and a woman's sexuality? What is the imagery we're giving from the Song of Solomon? It's a garden. Now if, you're, if you know your Bible, you're like, that's interesting because gardens are a big deal. That's interesting because everything starts in a garden. We go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, right? It's like, and by the way, when, when the sexual relationship between a husband and wife is good and meaningful, it's almost like going back to the Garden of Eden, okay? But what he's saying is, is that, let me say it this way, a woman's body is to be a garden, not a public park. Now, let me explain that, okay? So this is, this is not to make anyone feel any kind of shame or guilt on anything that they've done in the past. Because here's what happened. So here's what a garden was back then. It's very similar to today. But every garden had a wall around it. And it had one door, okay, that you could get into. So think about it. What is a garden? It's secluded. It's safe. It's private. It's beautiful. How does a garden become a public park? A couple different ways. Somebody breaks in and enters who shouldn't have been there. And that's some people have that story. And again, we are sorry. And there's hope. And there's healing. If, if you've had sexual trauma, 
and sexual assault and sexual abuse. One of the things the gospel does is it lets, it lets uh, the gospel forgives us of our sins and the gospel also cleanses us from the sin that's been done against us. But sometimes a garden gets destroyed because somebody broke in who shouldn't be there. Sometimes a garden gets destroyed because no one ever put up any walls. And that's part of the job of parents. Basically, parents build the walls until the kids leave. And you hope you build enough walls where the kids go, yeah, that's probably a good wall as I head off to college. I probably need to protect this garden. Another way the garden becomes a public park is when you leave the door open and invite everybody in. Again, there is redemption, there is renewal, there is restoration. Jesus loves to uh, renew people and to rebuild gardens, okay? And, and that's, that's what the purity movement lost. They lost the, the idea of what God can do and how he can change us and how he can renew us, okay? But I, I want us to see this, and I want you to see something very, very interesting. Look, look again, go back real quick with me. Look at verse 15. I want you to see what it says. Verse, or sorry, verse 16. So he calls her body a garden. And then look at this, verse 16. Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind, blow upon my garden. Now, this is very interesting. The man looks at the woman's body and says, it's my garden. He, he looks at her body and says, that, that body belongs to me. Now, now, that may be offensive, but I want you to see what she says. The only time she speaks in the entire book, in verse 16, look what she says. With great excitement and with great invitation, she says this, let my beloved come to his garden. Isn't that amazing? She, he says, your body is my garden. And she says, my body is your garden. It's, it's very sensual. It's very intimate. She says this, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. See, by the way, everything I'm teaching here shows up other places in Scripture more explicitly. So if you want to have a good conversation, go to 1 Corinthians 7 sometime because Paul's writing to married couples and he says, hey, listen, when you get married, I'm summarizing this. He says, the man's body no longer belongs to him but belongs to the wife. And the wife's body no longer belongs to her but belongs to the husband. And every husband goes, well, I'm willing to make that trade. <laughs> but what it's saying, is, this doesn't mean that you get to do whatever you want. It's this beautiful picture of mutual service it's a beautiful picture of mutual submission. It's a beautiful picture of what only can happen in covenant, is that the two can become one and we can belong to each other in a way that we belong to nobody else. And we can share something with each other that we share with nobody else. That's the beautiful nature of covenant. Now, we live in a society where when it comes to sexuality, they ha we have no longer care about covenant. We care about one other thing or something else instead. We care about consent. I want to I wanna try to explain what's happening at your workplace. I, I want to try to explain what's happening on the college campus. Um, I want to explain what is the Me Too movement? Well, it's a lot of things, right? It's kind of complex to, to talk about. There are several good things that came out of the Me Too movement. You know, men who were, particularly men, who were abusing power and sexually assaulting women, you know, it, it, it came to light. But what is every conversation in regards to me, the Me Too movement about consent. That's what it's about. We're having to have conversations we've never had to have before. Because we used to say as a society, we weren't all Christian, hey, marriage should be saved for sex, or sorry, a sex should be saved for marriage. And inside of a covenant, you don't have to ask all those questions because you've committed to each other for a lifetime, right? Well, here's, we live in this weird society. Here's what we want to say about sex in our society today. And you'll, you'll hear, you'll feel this as soon as I say it. We want to say this, let's have sex, let's let everybody have sex and do whatever they want, whenever they want, with whoever they want, for as long as they want. So at one level we want to say that, and then we want to say, but if you do one little thing that I don't like, I will mob you and sue you and ruin your life. Well, both of those can't be true. Sex can't be nothing and free and do whatever I want to do with it. And the moment I don't like something, it's over. And I will, and I will ruin and wreck your life. Because, here, let's take it practically. Here, here's, here, here's a real practical thing. Okay, we've got men and women. So, for the first time in human history, we have men and women who aren't related to them, each other, working together for long periods of time. That's about 50 or 70 years old. It's, men and women have been working together since Adam and Eve, I get that. But men 
working with women who they're not related to for long periods of time on very meaningful work and traveling together. These are all new ideas. Okay, we have to figure out how to do all this stuff. And then you add this, okay, what is the difference between an invitation, a sexual invitation, and harassment? Well, the cynic would say whether it was wanted. Well, here, here's a little fact. 99% of the time, who makes a sexual invitation? Men. And 99% of the time, it's rejected. We are living in this confusing world where we're having to ask all of these questions and have all of these conversations because we want sex to mean nothing, but it, that can't happen. The only safe place for sex is in a covenantal relationship where you can say, this is my garden, and she can say, this is your garden. Now, I want to show you something very interesting. At the very end, look what happens in verse 16. This is, this is the language of the full sexual experience in verse 1. Nine times he calls her body his own. I came to my garden my sister, my bride, I gathered my myrrh with my spice, I ate my honeycomb with my honey, I drank my wine with my milk. I, I want to, as we close, try to get as pra even more practical than I've been and try to help us together, okay? Try to give us some resources. These might not be for you today, they may be for somebody that, they may be for your kids, they, they may be for someone you do premarital counseling with, but I want, I want to give you a couple things. One of the things is when you see all this and you see all the sexual experience that, that they're having and you see the full enjoyment, people ask this, what's permissible in the bedroom? Well, I'm obviously not going to talk about this for very long, but, but except to say that um, here, here's some questions to ask. Does this bring us closer to one another? Is there mutual consent? Does this bring us closer to God? Is this safe? And let me give you the existential experience to, if, to think these things through. Don't do anything in the bedroom that you can't talk about with each other outside of the bedroom. That's the test. If you can't have a conversation with your spouse about what you're doing in the bedroom, you shouldn't be doing it in the bedroom. But I want to give us a couple other practical tools as we think. I want to give us three questions as we close and think about this together. The first question is, do you know the difference? We're gonna get so practical here, it's gonna be uncomfortable for some of you. Um, do you know the difference between fun sex and body oneness? So these are helpful categories, I didn't come up with these. Um, so here's the problem, this is, I'm talking about expectations. So what happens in marriage is people, it doesn't just have to be the husband, it could be the wife, it could be both. Uh, we come to sex with the wrong expectations. We expect fun sex all the time. By fun sex, I mean sex that you've seen in the movies. By fun sex, I mean some type of sexual high. By fun sex, you mean some passionate experience. Candidly, by fun sex, I mean some orgasmic pursuit. It's like, that's going to leave you frustrated, your spouse frustrated, both of you frustrated. Sometimes we want things from sex that sex can't give us. Sometimes we have completely unrealistic expectations of sex and we don't expect that it's going to have the normal range of pleasure like any other human experience, what you should push toward and go for is not fun sex, but body oneness. Well, that makes a lot more sense because that's actually, that's us connecting body and soul. That's us relating. That's us lowering our expectations and serving one another. And here's the honest truth. Oftentimes, body oneness can end up turning into fun sex. But people are frustrated when all they want is fun sex and they don't understand the biblical principle of simply coming together in body oneness. That's the first thing. Second thing, do you know the difference between grace, not great, grace sex and law sex? Some people, I know Christians are like, we're, we're under grace, not under the law. Well, in your sex life, it feels like you're under the law, right? I will reward you and I will punish you with sex. I will manipulate you and I will control you with sex. But this can happen with either spouse. I've heard more and more stories about women who w wish their husbands would initiate more. And they know that, and they try to communicate that, to, and, and the guy is living more under law and not serving his wife. I've seen, I've heard stories many times of women who, nope, they don't want to have sex until they'd like to get pregnant. 
And then they're very available. And then they're very willing. And then they're very initiative because it's something that they want. It's law sex, not grace sex. It's selfish hearted, not servant hearted. Third question, do you know how to diagnose the problems in your sex life? So I know we're getting super proud of here. So I told you there's a difference between body oneness and fun sex. There's a difference between grace sex and law sex. And then there's the three, there's, okay, so in 1960, they did a big study on, biggest study ever, I think, to date, on sex within marriage and problems. And, they, and you'll get this as soon as I say it. They found out there's three big problems in sex, in marriage. Um, here's what they are. Problems in the person, problems between the persons, and problems with the technique. That's it. So I, I, part of what I'm trying to give you is good handles and resources to go, if we're having problems, you want to start with, is it me? Right? It's like, well, maybe I have, we've talked about some of these things. Maybe I have past experiences that I've not been honest about and dealt with. Maybe I have views of my body or views of sexuality that are wrong. Maybe I have some health issues I need to address. Okay, that's problems in the person. That's where you start. Okay, we're going to do it. Then there's problems between the persons. That's the whole sex is the symbol and sign of your, of your marriage. It's like, well, maybe there's unforgiveness. Maybe we're just like so busy with four kids and two jobs and not communicating very well and not value. We've got some, something's wrong here. And then there's problems. I'm not going to get into detail on this. There's problems with the technique, okay? I, I, I've done a lot of premarital counseling. I'm unbelievable. Maybe I shouldn't be so amazed. I, I am amazed at how many people come to marriage with no understanding of, of actual the technique of sex. That there is desire. That there is arousal. That there is climax. There, that there are these processes. Now, now, here's the encouraging word about this. Sex is like a sport or a discipline. Any sport, it's something that you get better at across time. So when I do premarital counseling, I always tell the couple, get ready for wonderfully awkward honeymoon sex. <laughs> but don't put too much pressure on yourself. Because it's something that you're going to get better at across time. Now, here's what's the most interesting part of the I've not even gotten to it yet. The most interesting part of this entire passage is how chapter 5, verse 1 ends. Look at this. So he, the husband just said, you know, I, I, I came, to, you know, came to the garden and he says all these things. I want you to see what happens in chapter 5, verse 1, part B, okay? So after that, it says this. Somebody else speaks, okay? And it says this. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Now, people go, who's that? What weirdos showed up? Is this, is this their friends? Is this the bridesmaids? And most commentators actually believe this is the one time in the book God speaks, which lets us think maybe a little bit differently about God. It's like this picture of they just had this unbelievable sexual experience in marriage together, and it ends with God picking up his pom-poms and going, woohoo! <laughs> that was awesome! Which makes all of us feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but here's the idea, guys. It's that God invented sex. It was his idea. We said that already. And he invented it ultimately to point to him. It's, and now it's interesting. He uses not just marital language. That's more common. He'll use mar marital language to talk about his relationship with us. On many occasions he will begin to actually use sexual language. This is why we can't have the purity culture mindset or the pornographic mindset. He will use sexual language to talk about his relationship with his people. Let me give you an example. The Apostle Paul, he's writing to the Corinthian church in chapter six, and he says to the Corinthian church, he goes, guys, don't be joined to a prostitute because they were struggling with different things. So we, we all know what that means, don't be joined to a prostitute. Then he says in the next verse, but be joined to the Lord instead. Did you just use sexual language to talk about my relationship with the Lord? Yep. Go read Ezekiel chapter 16 and you'll blush. God gives a graphic image of a sexual relationship and says, that's what it's like to be known by me and for me to know you. Here's why God uses sexual imagery. It's to communicate the Christian life is not merely intellectual. Like our relationship with God is not merely intellectual. It's not merely rational. It's certainly not just religion. It's like our relationship with God is highly emotional. It's highly personal. 
It's highly vulnerable. Why? Why? Because what are we saying with sex? In sex, we say this, I give all of me to you. This is the visible sign of it. And in, in response, the spouse says, yeah, that's right. And I give all of myself to you. Well, guess what? That's exactly what God has done in Jesus Christ. What is the cross of Christ but Jesus Christ himself saying, I'm not going to tithe my blood. I'm going to give you all of me. Right? God says, I'm going to give you my first, my best, my only son. I'm going to give you all of him. And then when you come to faith in Christ, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit fully. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a church family and I'm going to give you a home in heaven forever. It's like God is a giver and God is a forgiver. And God has said, in some great mystery to us, I'm going to give you all of me. So I'm going to, I've got to use sexual language. I've got to use sexual imagery to communicate that. But God, as we learned tonight, and God knows this and God said this, it doesn't work one way. We can't just have one person give themselves fully and the other not. The call of the Christian is, would you give yourself fully to the Lord? And, and, Lord, I give you my past. Lord, I trust you with my future. Lord, I give you my sin. God, I give you myself. God, I give you my sexuality. God, I give you everything. See, every married Christian in here that has two callings. First, it's to give themselves fully to the Lord. And then after that, by God's grace, it's for us to give ourselves fully to our spouse. Those are the types of marriages that we want to see created and sustained in our church those are the types of marriages we want to pray for. Let's pray. Lord, we lift up our, the marriages in our church. Lord, we know there are single people. There are people who find themselves single again. Uh, Lord, but we want to just take a moment and pray for the marriages, Lord. Pray just that we would, our, our church would be a church where people would, they would make the conscious decision to move from me to we. Lord, that there would be a pursuit in the marriage of oneness that as it's pursued at every other level, it actually ends up showing up in the sexual relationship in marriage as well, Lord. Lord, we pray against the, the different ways that our sexuality can be disintegrated, Lord, and we pray instead for it to be integrated, Lord. We pray for there to be healthy marriages and healthy families, Lord, that we would give ourselves fully to you, Lord, because you've given yourself, yourself fully to us, and that in love and service, we would give ourselves fully to our spouse. We pray this in Jesus' name.